feel like a minister. <laughs> I've never been at one of these things before. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's, um, it's great to be in your stunning, stunning university location. And when I was wandering a little bit around the town today before it started to rain, and given that I'm Scottish, I'm used to wandering around places in the rain. Um, it reminded me of when I was at it took, well, it kind of took me back to when I was at university and I, I, I did French and business studies at Edinburgh. And I still have this recurring dream from time to time of not finishing my exams. And apparently it's really, really common. And uh, I googled it once and it basically said that if you have this recurring dream, it actually represents a phase of your life that you feel you haven't completed properly. And I thought, you know, what do I remember about university? Actually, I remember all the sports things. And I got a blue for squash and a blue for badminton and a half blue for tennis. I mean, what is that all about? But <laughs> I don't remember so much about the actual studying and the doing the exams, because for me, the university represented the opportunity to do all sorts of sports and play in teams um, and, and so forth. But I think that what you realise when you are very much older um, than you are now, or you students, is um, just how much this period of your life um, shapes you and how much the people who create the opportunities for you to learn or to play in, in, in a team um, can really shape the, the rest of your, your life. And it's the same when you're at school. I think you realise it when you're older. You know, the teachers that had a huge influence on you it's not all of them do, and it, you know it can be for completely different different reasons. And I think as a as a as a coach myself, I I've been coaching for about thirty years, and I absolutely love it that the bulk of the kids that I've worked with um, still remain in tennis in some shape or form because you've created the environment that nurtures the love of what they do and all the friends that you make from it, and that's really what keeps you. Um, doing something. So I'm going to share with you hopefully my, uh, my story. Um, I started as a volunteer um, at our tennis club in Dunblane when my kids were in nappies. It was nothing to do with them and I kind of did it to get out of the house because they're 15 months apart and they were driving me nuts. Um, and it just, you know, everything that we learned and experienced um, on the way up to where they ended up as they were year-end world number ones in doubles and singles, Jamie in doubles, Andy in, in singles in 2016, which for two little brothers from a small town in Scotland that has shit weather and doesn't really do tennis was really nothing we ever would have, have um, imagined would, would happen to us. So I've got lots of stories uh, to tell you and um, I'm ready when you are, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wanted to start with talking about your work to combat sexism in sport. So beginning in 2011, you led the British Fed Cup as their team captain for over four years. And you said that you took this job to raise the profile of female coaches and to combat the sexism that remains in sport. Um, so now in 2019, how much progress do you feel has been made in this area over the past decade? Yeah, that, that's quite a good question to start with because um, I was, when I was offered the job of Fed Cup captain, it was such a big thing for me because I had been the Scottish national coach for 10 years from 2000 and, uh, sorry, from 1995 to early 2005. And when I stopped doing that job to concentrate on Andy and Jamie's careers, because when you're a young player, you need to focus all your, t your time on learning how to play the game and competing and the circuit and the training and all the rest of it. And you're not old enough and you certainly don't have time to manage all the logistics and everything that goes around the life and business of being a professional athlete. And you need somebody that you can trust to, to do that. So really in those years from 2005 to back end of 2011, I had become known as Andy and Jamie's mum and not tennis coach and so when I was offered the Fed Cup captain job it was it really gave me an enormous um, huge boost huge confidence boost that somebody was recognizing that I was a good coach and not just the boy's mum and um, when I it didn't take me long to get into the job 
uh, before I discovered that it is so much harder to make things happen on the women's side of the game than it is on the men's side of the game. So for example with the Fed Cup, you know, I was having to fight to take a backroom staff of four people with me, whereas the Davis Cup bench has often 19 people on it. And I knew all this because of course of doing, doing those ties with the, with the boys and I was like, why are you making me fight for a video an analyst? You know, partly I want to do the job as well as I possibly can, but the other part is we need to grow people. Um, we need to give people the opportunity to experience these big occasions because we need a workforce that can develop players at all steps of the game. So I always had a, a kind of twofold goal. You know, there was the players and then there was the creating of a workforce that could make us stronger as a female tennis nation. And when we went to our first Fed Cup tie, it was in Israel. And uh, a funny story on the way to Israel, we, we had to uh, get off in Tel Aviv, we had to change terminals to go on a domestic flight to El Elat. And we were told it would be very tricky in Tel Aviv getting, getting ac across the, the terminals and getting everything through security, because security was quite understandably very, um, very difficult there. So we hired a company to help us. And because we were signed in as a group, there was a problem with one of the cases as it went through all these security checks. But because we travelled as a group, every, every case had to come off and every case had to be opened. And we found the offending item, which in my uh, attempts for ensuring that we have really good team building, I'd asked everybody pr to bring a game with them so we could play games as a team in, in, in the evening. Because tennis, for most of the year, is an individual sport. And so for this one week of the year, we were bringing everybody together. It's a group of individuals and you're trying to make them into a team. And, and some of them didn't like each other. Some of them didn't even speak to each other. So I thought, right, we'll play games. You know, this is the, the kind of mum thing in me. But and Laura Robson had brought a game with her that was the offending um, article. And it was a game called Pass the Bomb. So it had this little timer that was a little, um, a little uh, bomb thing in it. And that was the thing that was on the... Yeah, anyway, and I went, oh, who does that? <laughs> who does that? But um, yeah, but you know, so we, we, we get to Elat and uh, we discover that the place that we're playing at is just like a community centre, regular community centre, six or so outdoor hard courts, very small clubhouse, and they had erected a stand around one of the courts to create a centre court. And it was very much like playing a club match. There was nobody there to watch us. You know, nobody had travelled all that way to watch our team. There was no media there because it was just after the Australian <coughs> Open. And basically, what it made me realise that was nobody was really interested in the Fed Cup. Nobody back then knew what it was. And I thought, right, OK, how do we create profile? And in those days, uh, Twitter and Facebook were more in their infancy than they are now. And uh, I said, right, we have to create our own stuff. You know, we film things, we take pictures, we give behind the scenes, this is what's going on, etc., etc. So we created our own, we started to create our own profile from, from that moment on, but we were in a, a quite an obscure zone, um, the, the Euro-Africa zone. And what I discovered was that the Fed Cup, there's 16 teams in one zone, so we didn't have home and away ties like the men. So the Fed Cup and the Davis Cup are both run by the ITF, but the men's tournament was this and the women's was this. So I started to fight against that and for changes to raise the profile because team tennis is much easier to sell the sport to, to girls and women than individual sport is because we like being with our friends. We, we, we like the group thing. And it, it, led, it led me into all sorts of things. Uh, you know, firstly, looking at where our next juniors were coming from. What, you know, because uh, I'd always been on the men's side of the game with the boys, so I didn't really know much about what was happening in the women's girls. And I, we don't have very many junior girls coming through. Um, when I looked right back at the start of the game, we have four times as many boys coming into the game as girls, and we have very few female coaches. And that was, I thought, well, right, we need something to make tennis more engaging, more fun, more stimulating for little girls. And we need something that will encourage more women to get involved in delivering tennis, um, whether that's coaching or whether it's running events. And that was the start of my kind of what has become um, She Rallies, which is a workforce building program, female workforce building program, and uh, a little um, a, a kids program called Miss Hits, which is, is aimed at five to eight year olds. But it's all, I think you need to have women 
making decisions on behalf of women in sport because we understand the world according to women and mostly in sport it's a traditional thing it's just how it's always been through history is that the key decision makers in sport tend to be men and they will think and act on behalf of men first which is perfectly natural but we have to change that so we have to get women in into decision making positions and that was the start of my whole thing of um trying to grow the women's side of, of, of the game, but I had no idea how bad it was until I got in amongst it. So following on from that, in 2016, you called for a rethink over a revealing Nike dress that was designed for women at that year's Wimbledon. Um, and you said that one of the most important things for manufacturers to keep in mind when designing these outfits is that they're functional for the job at hand. But many brands focus on more how, on how attractive the clothes may look, especially for women. Um, because they try to popularise the sport through how they look instead of through their talent. So in your view, how else can we combat this culture to create a shift in this mentality? And have you seen a shift occur over the past five years? I think any athlete will tell you that the, the functionality of the material and the fit of the, the garment is the most, is the most important thing. The, there's no question about that. And I think we have been fortunate in tennis that we are a relatively equal sport compared to, to some of the others. We're lucky that the, the, the major events, the Grand Slams, are men's and women's events, so the women have pretty much equal profile, equal prize money, equal endorsement opportunities. And also tennis has benefited from having the Williams sisters and Sharapova as three of the global superstars of sport who happen to be from tennis, and when they disappear, we will lose out big time because we don't have the profiles and the superstars to replace them at the moment. We've got lots of good players, but you almost need, it's a bit like the Tiger Woods thing, you need somebody who everybody identifies with who's mega, mega, mega successful, um, you know, to, to really grow the, the, the profile. But I think there's, um, I think there's a lot to be said for well, I think a lot of progress has been made in terms of, if you look at the, the fashion stores, nearly all of them have a sports line now. Sports clothing has become a cool thing to wear, you know, whether it's the colours or the, you know, the, the, the patterns or the whatever. But you see many more people wearing sports because it has become much more trendy and it's become more, more of a, a fashion item. And, and that's a good thing. But I would say that anybody who is competing as an athlete will always go for for function first but that's probably where the manufacturers need to work with the with the athletes to make it both it needs to be something that they enjoy wearing and has the functionality as well um, so moving on to your passion for tennis growing up you won 64 titles in scotland during your career before deciding to start professional tour in 1976 um, so what motivated you to make the transition from playing to coaching um well, what happened was that when I went to, before I went to Edinburgh University, I did my first coaching badge, and it, it was three weekends. Was basically that was what it took to to get it, and I did it um, not because I wanted to be a coach, but I did it as a means of making some pocket money when I was a student um, on the weekends, and actually never used it at all. Um, I I got a um, a little coaching job up at Craig Lockhart um, Sports Centre in my early days of my first year at university. And what I realized was that I had no idea how to talk to this group of eight kids in front of me. And it didn't matter how well I played the game or the drills that I knew and all the rest of it. It doesn't prepare you for having eight kids in front of you and you actually don't know how to speak to them or how to organize them. And what I realized was that that coaching course didn't prepare me for what it was I was going to do. It gave me, showed me activities and taught me you know, technical things and so forth, but it didn't give me those communication skills, which at 17 are not always easy to, to develop. So I never used it after that. <laughs> um, and then when, just actually on the day that Andy was due to be born, we moved house from Glasgow to Dunblane. And who does that? I mean, who does that? I mean, really, really, who does that? Well, I did. Um, and we moved from Glasgow to Dunblane to be nearer my parents. My kids are 15 months apart, and really anybody who has kids 15 months apart is quite mad. But I, we, moved back for, we moved back to Dunblane, and I had to give up my job 
um, and I was a sales rep for a confectionery company. I was a national accounts manager, which basically meant I dealt with all the Woolworths and John Menzies, WH Smiths, you know, all the, the big supermarkets and so forth, and I did all their block, buy, uh, block selling for them. And it involved a lot of travelling, and I went back to work after Jamie was born, but, you know, when... Uh, with two of them 15 months apart it just wasn't going to happen so I lost my job and I lost my car my car went with the job I left my tennis club I left my friends and I was back in Dunblane where the only people I knew or it felt like it were my mum and dad's friends and it didn't take long for me to kind of feel trapped by these two little kids so I I went over um, and rejoined the tennis club that I'd been a member of when I was a kid. Found there was still no coaches, there was no coaches in my day obviously, still no coaches, nobody working with the, the junior players and I started to volunteer and I volunteered just for two hours a week to start off with and I, I wasn't a coach so I didn't teach them how to hit the ball, I taught them how to play the game which is different. Um, and that was how I learned how to play the game. I learned with my parents first, then with the other kids at the club, and then with the adults at the club. There was never any individual coaching or really group sessions or anything like that. It was just how you learned back then. So I taught in the, exactly the same way. And many years later, my kids would come to be great tacticians at a very young age because I taught them how to play the game first rather than how to, to hit the ball. So it started off on two hours a week. And as more parents came and asked me if their kids could join in, I started to trade tennis sessions for childcare. Don't judge me. <laughs> but I, I was doing it for, for free and we didn't have money, um, you know, so it was, I couldn't afford to pay for childcare and be doing it for free. And we had a super clubhouse at our club and we had a, a park across the road. And so the, the mums would look after Andy and Jamie for the hour that I was working or the hour and a half or, or whatever. And that was really how I got into it. And I discovered that I loved teaching as much as I had loved playing. And actually, all through my high school years, I thought I was going to be a PE teacher. And when I got to my final year in school, my form teacher said to me, the teaching profession is in a bit of a shambles. There's no jobs. I advise you to do languages at university. So, of course, I did what she suggested. And many years later, I did what my gut had always told me I was going to do. It's quite interesting. So um, that, that was kind of how I got started in coaching. But it, it became a very cottage industry in the club because if you're volunteering anything, um, you'll know that the more you do, the more people ask you to do and the more they expect you to do. And I realised with two young kids, I couldn't do everything at the club. So I was sort of learning how to coach and I was learning how to run competitions just by myself because there was nobody to learn from. And um, I realised I needed some people to help me. So I started a, like a little parents' army, which were mostly the mums because they, they were the ones who were around. And between us, we came up with, this, in time, this unbelievable community club that had school teams, club teams, uh, competitions for kids, teens and adults. Uh, we had a cafe going. We, you know, So somebody was doing the reports for the local paper. Somebody was doing the logistics for the matches. I could do the coaching, somebody was, you know, making the, making the club, the match tees and all the rest of it. So it became a real cottage industry. Um, and then in time, I moved from that to work in our wider district in order to keep more of the kids playing in the district all year round. So I used to work in school halls. I used to, in the days when you were allowed to get a key from the janitor and open up a school hall, and it'd be the polished floor with a zillion lines all over it and the lines would be up against the, the walls. And I, I discovered all, you know, I was really creative. I probably still am quite creative, but you know, it's like for me, everything was always about it's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And I was thinking, God, the ball goes too fast on these polished floors and the lines are too, can you take your racket back and you hit the wall? And, and then I discovered that the tennis balls, if I put them in the tumble dryer, they fluffed up. And if I took the hairbrush to them, they fluffed up even more and it slowed them down. Because in those days, you didn't have these pressureless tennis balls. And I thought, oh yes, we can play with these things. So I actually feel like I could have been like Dyson, you know, if somebody had really believed in me. But um, it's funny the things you, you, you kind of remember. But I became very good at creating sessions for big numbers of kids in relatively small spaces, which is actually what I've gone back to doing in the last five years. Um, so I, I, wor I worked in the wider district and then I upgraded my qualification that I'd done because I felt I didn't know enough and kids were playing with these weird grips, you know what Rafa uses, you know, and he's got his grip away around here and top spin serves and double-handed backhands because I learned with a wooden racket, you know, step in, turn your shoulders, follow through over your shoulder and it just wasn't holding up, you know, and I was like, oh my god, you know. 
So I went and did another qualification and I still didn't feel it. It took a week and it did, did a full time week. And it, you know, at the end of it, it was again, the same thing, information, but no showing you how to practically apply it. And then about a year later, I went and did another a course called the Performance Coach Award. And it was a brand new course that the LTA had been plotting for a number of years and applied for a place on it. Didn't really expect to get it because um, I was still part time and, and more or less voluntary and there was only 20 spaces on it. And I got a space on it, and I, I got a space on it, I think, because there was a woman who was the head of coach education. And when I got down there to the first workshop, everything was down south, so big time commitment, big financial commitment, and my kids were like seven and eight. But I knew that to invest in the kids that I was working with at the club and in the wider district, I needed to invest in myself um, first. So I went off and did this thing and I, I, I appeared at the first workshop which was in Basingstoke and I was feeling completely out of my depth because I discovered there was 18 men and two women and 19 people who were full-time employed coaches, most of them at big clubs and many of them were pretty high profile ex-players and I was just thinking, what have I done? What, you know, I, I played at a good level but I just felt completely out of my depth. So I know what it feels like to be a woman in a male-dominated situation where you're scared to put your hand up, you're scared to ask a question, you don't want to be asked to demonstrate anything, and I kind of hid away for most of the time. But on that first workshop, I came up against my first encounter of, of sexism. I'd never had anything in my club or in my backyard because I was always leading everything. You were never stepping on anybody's toes because there was no toes to step on. And I turn up at this thing and one of the tutors said to me, ah, oh, uh, welcome to the course, and then said, you're very lucky to get a place on this course, you know, we had to turn a lot of guys away. And I looked at him and I thought, okay, and I said, right, okay. I said, well, I'm looking, looking forward to it. And he said, you know, we actually had a written complaint about you getting a place on this course. And I looked at him and I thought, why on earth is he saying this to me? Because I, you know, you always remember how people make you feel. And when you're involved in coaching, you absolutely make sure that everybody is treated evenly and everybody feels good about themselves because you cannot get a change in behaviour or an improvement in performance if people don't feel good about themselves. And that is particularly true with girls, I learned from Fed Cup. And um, yeah, he said, yeah, we had, this we had a written complaint about you. He said, um, he told me who it was and I knew who it was. And um, he said, yeah, he said, what could you possibly offer to performance coaching when you have two kids? So I looked at him and uh, I went off and sulked for about an hour. And then I went into fuck you mode. <laughs> and that mode has served me very, very well as a woman in a male dominated environment for many, many years. And I just thought, right, I'm here now. I've got a place on it. I'm just going to ignore you, tutor. I will never speak to you again unless I absolutely have to. And from time to time, I sometimes see that coach who complained about me around the place, not for a few years now. And I always go, ha! <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, so I finished that course. So this is quite a long answer to your question. It's to try and give you the context of everything that I kind of came through. So I passed that course after a year. It doesn't make me a better coach. It just gives me loads and loads of information and a huge portfolio of projects. So I passed that course because I'm clever and I can do all the projects. I didn't pass it because I was a good coach. So again, I was in the same situation. Nobody ever put themselves in front of us coaching a live, you know, a, a player that they worked with day in and day out. And that's what I wanted to learn about. How do you set a player development program? How do you bring it day in and day out? What do you do? How do you plan it? Never were shown anything about that. It was all just lecture style, academia, more or less. And, um, but a few things happened as a result of that. One was that I got the opportunity to travel with the under 12 girls, Great Britain teams, a little and with the, some of the under 14s. And that opened a whole new world to me of access to coaches from other countries who were vastly, vastly more experienced, of course, than I was, and who were working with young kids. And it gave me awareness of um, the competition structure in other countries, how all the ranking systems uh, worked and so forth. And that was like gold dust for me. I didn't realize it at the time, but if I hadn't had that opportunity, I wasn't seeing any of that based in, you know, based in Scotland. So that was a massive opportunity and it was created for me by a woman. My place on that PCA course was created by a woman. And then the Scottish National Coach job came up, which had been vacant for 18 months. 
mainly because nobody wanted it. And if you think about it, um, no track record of tennis in Scotland, no infrastructure, no indoor courts. Who's going to want that job? You know, you, you're starting with nothing. There's no international level coaches. Um, so it's not going to attract somebody from another country. And I was persuaded to go for it by a woman who was the Secretary of Tennis Scotland at the time, but now you'd call it a Chief Exec. And she persuaded me to go for it. And I said, I couldn't possibly do that. Kids are young and um, don't have any experience. And she goes, you know what, you've, you've got the passion. And she said, it's the passion, it's the most important thing. And I thought, oh, well, I, and I went for it. And anyway, I, I got it. And it was 25,000 pound salary. This is 1995, um, 90,000 pound budget then that's for everything, the whole of Scotland, from everything from age seven, this sort of talent ID stuff, right through to the senior players, everything for competitions, for training, no, no staff. Um, so me, my hopper, and actually a block booking at some indoor courts that just opened at Stirling University, which was our first indoor centre in Scotland. Um, and I realised I had to start quite small and I, toddled around the country and tried to find what I thought was the best 20 kids across Scotland, aged between 7 and 11. And some of them were having to travel three hours to get to this one indoor centre, and we could only really do things on the weekend, apart from the ones who lived close enough to be able to access a little during the week. Um, but of those um, 20 kids, Andy would be the youngest, Elena Baltasha would have been the oldest at 11. We made four Davis Cup players and one Fed Cup player and Baltasha was British number one for many years, uh, made top 50 in the world. And uh, Jamie and Andy did what they did with their Grand Slams in the Davis Cup and world number ones in Olympic gold and silvers that, that Andy won. Colin Fleming made a gold in Commonwealth Games mixed doubles in Delhi in 2010. Jamie Baker made 150 in the world singles. So we, out of our little cottage industry, so remember no money, no staff. So who did I bring in to help me? The parents. I taught them how to run matches. We did car shares to, to competitions, to training. They put each other up overnight. And we created a real community the same way that I'd done at, at the club. I was so I really just went with my instinct. And if I had the chance to do it again, which I won't because I'm too old, I would do exactly the same thing because it's people who make things happen and it's passion that drives, that drives people. So um, after a few years of doing that, some of the kids were getting really good at a young age. And I, you know, again, I realized I didn't know enough and I didn't have a workforce and you can't do it by yourself. So I thought I need to start to build a coaching workforce. And I applied for some money from Sports Scotland, which is our governing body of sport. And my job as a national coach was paid for by Sports Scotland. It wasn't an LTA position. So I largely could do whatever I liked. Yes. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever came up to annoy me until we started winning all the British under 12 and British under 14 titles, and then people started to come up to try to tell me what to do, which is a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is, because I cared about my players. You know, and so anybody coming up who doesn't know my players and trying to tell you what to do, one-off things don't work. For, for me, it, you, you know, you have to create relationships and you... Anyway, I... Um, what was I going to tell you next? Yeah, so I, I was building a workforce. So I got from Sports Scotland £10,000 a year for six years to, for a performance coach development programme. I didn't know anything about building a programme, but what I did know is that that course that I had done did not make me a better coach. And you need to have access to people who can walk the walk and talk the talk and will do it with you. So I brought people in from other countries and I brought them in for two or three days at a time, three times a year. So we create relationships and sense of belonging. And I started with probably about eight young coaches. Six of them lasted the course and, um, you know, over that whole six year, year period. And some of them you might, you might know, Karen Ross, uh, she headed up Br Br British Disability Tennis um, up until just very recently. She coached Gordon Reid, who was the world number one wheelchair player in 2016. Uh, Chris Souter, who's one of the best coach educators, um, Ewan McGinn, who heads up the Tennis Scholarship Programme at University of Stirling, very successful Tennis Scholarship Programme. And the one who you will know is uh, Leon Smith, who is, who's head of men's tennis and our Davis Cup captain. And he started with me when he was 20. He, he dropped out of college. He, he um, wanted to become a tennis coach. And uh, I said, look, I haven't got any money to 
pay you, but you can work with me, I can create opportunities for you to travel, to work with the best kids and all the rest of it. And he threw himself at it and he was absolutely brilliant. And he had this bleach blonde hair. He was like what David Beckham looked like at a young age with the curtains down the middle and bleach blonde hair and a diamond in each ear. And the kids thought he was the dog's bollocks <laughs> in a way that I would never be the dog's bollocks. And um, he, he played well, you know, good county level player. And so I, he's like my third son. He, you know, I mentored him pretty much all of his life and very, very proud of everything that he's achieved and, and the, the, the young man that he's, that he's become as well. So we created this workforce. So out of our little cottage industry where we didn't really know what we were doing and we didn't have very much money, we didn't just create some great players, we created some great coaches as well. So I, I, I go back to what I said before, it's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have, it's about investing in people and everything that was achieved from in that period um, is a great example of, of anything's possible and it's one of the reasons why I don't understand <laughs> why we are so relatively unsuccessful in British tennis with all the money that there is. We should be and we have Wimbledon, we, we have the enormous profile. We should be doing a lot better than we currently do. So going back to what you said earlier about playing the game and how it's not just about learning how to hit the ball, can you give us an insight into the advice you give the, the players you coach when they, ha when they face particularly difficult opponents? And are there any particularly stressful or tense moments that you've overcome that stick out? Oh God, stressful moments. I mean, <laughs> there wasn't many. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, watching your own kids competing is incredibly stressful. Watching them playing a Grand Slam final or an Olympic final is just an, an awful. I mean, I really am surprised I'm still alive. Um, it, it's very stressful, but I think the, the, the key to coaching anyone to go into a pressurized situation is to make sure that they are as well prepared as you can possibly make them and all of that work is done way ahead of the actual match in terms of the the on-court training the preparation for a particular match is a, against a particular opponent is all done by video analysis now you know videoing that player playing matches pulling out the areas where they where they can cause you problems and where you can make them struggle. What I call systematic breakdown, you know. So somebody like Federer, who of course would be very difficult to break down, <coughs> you have to make him run more than three steps to his forehand before it'll break down. So you have to pull him out very wide on the backhand in order to make him run more than four steps on the forehand. Because if the forehand's two steps away, no, there's no stress. But you, I, I started to do video analysis in about 2002, three, and it came about when I went to, I was always trying to learn, because <coughs> there was nobody to learn from in Scotland, and I went to a, a sports conference where one of the uh, workshops was put on by Squash, and it was a um, university in, in Cardiff, and they had this very simple video analysis system of Squash Court, where they chopped the court into nine zones, and basically they had, uh, they had a player, a female player, who was in or around, uh, maybe around top 10, top 12 uh, in the world. And they had analysed all the players in front of her in the world who were the people she would have to beat to get to number one. And very simply, if they showed me one player in that workshop, or, or all of us that were there, they said, with this player, whenever she is put into zone nine, nine times out of 10, this is her response. So if you know that you put her in there, you know what she's going to do with it, you can be ready for the next one and you can knock it off, wherever it is. It, that's in very simple terms. And I thought, must be able to do that for tennis. And so I took it back, what, what they'd given me, and I went into the Scottish Institute of Sport and I said, could we create something like this for tennis? And they said, yeah, we could, you just, you tell us what it is you want. So I did kind of what Squash did and I chopped it up into zones and everything and we started to put it over some matches and all the rest of it. So I was doing video analysis probably before anybody else in tennis was doing it. And we created a really good system of our own in Scotland. And when we went to the US Open Juniors in 2004, I asked the Scottish Institute of Sport if we could take a video analyst with us because you need somebody to film the matches. You need somebody to tag all the information that you want. And if you are the coach and you're looking after three players and you're watching their matches and trying to watch their next opponents, you haven't got time to do all that stuff. And they allowed this to happen, and it was a young female video analyst. Uh, she wasn't a 
Tennessee person. She's actually a midwife now. I think we put her off for life. Um, she came with us. She would work through the night if she needed to, to tag it to be ready for the morning. And even if you are tagging a match that lasts two hours, you have to remember you're talking to junior players. They don't want to listen to you for two hours. You have to pocket it into 10 or 15 minutes of the most important things that are the tactics you want them to execute and the things they need to be aware of. So it's cause trouble, avoid trouble, get out of trouble. Those are my three things because kids understand what you're talking about. I said, this is how you cause trouble. This is how you avoid trouble. This is where he's going to hurt you or she's going to hurt you. And this is how you get out of trouble. So if you get yourself into trouble, here's what you're going to do here. Or, you know, you're going to defend it high, deep up the middle or high, deep into the backhand corner because they've got really short backswing and they can't deal with the high balls and so forth. And I love that part of the game because I learned to play the game. For me, the tactics and the mental side were everything because nobody ever taught me anything to do with the technical side or the physical side. So the challenge of competing and making it difficult for your opponent was a big thing. And so when I was doing Fed Cup, for me to prepare the players was all about analysing the opponents and predicting what they were going to do and making sure the players were ready for that. And if you go in more prepared, you are less stressed because you've got a plan rather than you go in and you make it up as you go along and you say, well, let's just wait and see what happens and I try to react. And it's much easier to do all that stuff now because there's so much tennis on TV that you can lift um, if, you, if you know what you're doing. So the, for me, the preparation is everything, but you have to develop problem-solving players. If you are a coach who just tells, tells, tells and sets up drills where they just do, do, do and they don't really think about what they're doing or they don't understand what's actually happening or they read what, don't read what's happening on the other side of the court. If they don't learn to solve their own problems and read the game and have variety to be able to change their plans if things are not going right, they're going down. And I am a, 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 a coach who challenges the players all the time. You, will, you won't hear me very often telling players what to do. You'll hear me asking them questions a lot. I say, well, what would you do if you got that shot again? Why do you think that one was difficult? Because they, you, you're not... You're not preparing them for the game. Tennis is a very cerebral sport and you're having to solve problems every time you hit the ball. How high, how, <laughs> how far, how deep, how hard, what's been, blah, 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 and where do I recover to and what's going to happen next? It's like chaos. So you have to develop the problem solvers and life doesn't, doesn't develop problem solvers now because we all have gadgets that solve our problems for us. It's like, and I think about every time I go in the car and I put it in the sat-nav, I could be anywhere. I don't know where I am. I just follow the sat-nav, where I used to get the map out and I go, oh, it's in Perthshire, or it's in Aberdeenshire, no, it's quite near here and here. You just see that anymore. And it all started with calculators. And now it's like, when I was looking after my twin nieces a, a, a few years ago, and they had maths homework, and I thought, oh, God, I was crap at maths. But I said, yeah, I'll try and help them do their maths homework to their mum and dad. And we were doing something, and I went, oh, I'm not too sure about that one. I said, we might have to look that one up. She said, it's OK, Auntie Judy, well, I'll ask Siri. And I said, oh, is that one of your pals? <laughs> and then I got this look that I realised I'd said something really stupid. I didn't even know what Siri was, and I thought, oh, that's too easy. It, it's too easy. Gadgets do all the problem solving for them. So the, the pressure thing is all in the preparation, but you have to develop problem solving players. Absolutely. Um, I think we have time to move to audience questions now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Um, you were talking about how tennis is much more gender even than other sports. What do you think other sports such as football, which is much further behind in that respect, can learn from tennis to improve? Um, I think that, f that f I mean, women's sport is in a very good place now. There's been a huge groundswell be behind it um, probably for five or six years now. And I think that the success of the England teams, women's teams in rugby, cricket, netball, hockey and football in recent years has been huge for um, visibility. Um, it is of a level where the play is so good that people want to watch it. Televisions want to show it and therefore it becomes more marketable and more sponsorable. And that is fantastic. It, it kind of bears out the whole thing of you need to invest in the performance to get it to a level where people want to watch it. And for a long time, women's sport, 
it didn't get the visibility, but, but it often wasn't of the level where people wanted to watch it anyway. And when the investment came into promoting the national teams in particular, and well, with f if you look at football, many of the top clubs now have women's teams, and they may not be on a par, anywhere near a par with the men's teams, but it's starting, and you have to start, and you have to, you have to grow. But I think football's in a football's in a great place. I mean, the Scotland women's team are in the World Cup, and the men haven't been in the World Cup for a generation. There's a generation of Scots who've never seen their team in the World Cup, and yet it's our national sport. So I think that football is in a very good place. But but tennis has been in a good place for a long time, and because of the visibility of and the marketability of the Grand Slams, which are men and men and women at the same event if that answers your question. Sorry. Um, Ali, you talked about a story about Boris Becker, which you were going to say. Um, but I also wanted to ask about how the approach of the people you've dealt with over time has changed with you being women coaching in tennis and generally in sport, and how you think about it. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. I think, um, I think in 2005, when Andy played in Wimbledon for the first time, as a just turned 18 year old, ranked about 350 in the world and in on a wild card. And there was no expectation of him to do anything. He'd been playing on the very first rungs of the men's tour and mostly in junior events up, you know, up to that point. And suddenly he's playing, he's playing at Wimbledon, he plays on court two and he wins, he plays on court one and he wins, and suddenly he's on the centre court at Wimbledon on the middle Saturday and I'm in the player box and I'm looking across the royal box and James Bond's in the royal box watching my son and I'm like, oh, Sean Connery, <coughs> Andy. It was like, you know, but I think in that first Wimbledon we all got catapulted into the spotlight and nobody prepares you for that. It's like one of many, many things that I had to learn to deal with as a mum and as a by that time sort of managing everything that, 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 that the boys were doing and it's a very difficult thing you know managing the managing the media and I think from that point really because it was an I was a bit of an anomaly as a as a female coach of and a mother of boys I think if I'd been a a mother of daughters or a father of sons or even a father of daughters I don't think I would have been picked out in the way that I was and what we learned so many things that first Wimbledon you know one of which was that tennis unlike any other sport uh, and especially Wimbledon which has no ad breaks tennis has 20 tw it did have 25 seconds it's now 20 seconds between each uh, point it has 90 seconds at a change of ends and a change of set and at Wimbledon with no ad breaks, the cameras and the commentators need somewhere to go. So you get picked out in the player box much more at Wimbledon than you do at any of the other Sams, but you get picked out more at tennis than you would, like if my kids had played football, nobody would know I existed. You just wouldn't. And so you realise that your sport is going to throw you into this situation. And I remember in that first Wimbledon, you know, that I read the number of opinion pieces I read about me and the pictures that I saw of myself in the paper were always like, like this. Now that's male journalists, male editors, male photographers. You know, so it, it, it's that very much man's, man's world. Um, but I also remember going, uh, going back to the little flat that we stayed in and realising there was paparazzi outside, that people were coming to the door and doorstepping you and it's like, you don't know how to deal with that. But we also realise that watching the highlights at Wimbledon, which is something I've done since I was a child, you're watching it and your 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 son is playing on it and then it goes into the player box and I'm doing this. <laughs> and they're doing it in slow motion. They've slowed me down and I've got a vest top on and everything's wobbling. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how slim you are, everything wobbles in slow motion. And I was like <sighs> But you never know when the cameras are, are on you and you shouldn't have to change your behaviour because but I did, next match. It's like clapping like a sea lion. Um, but it's very difficult reading stuff that's, you know, that, that are opinion pieces by people that you've never met and they don't know anything about you and you kind of have to try and apply the common sense and say that it doesn't matter. And 
I, I kind of applied that when, uh, when it came to me, but also when it came to Andy, because he came in for a lot of criticism as a, as a young, young player, you know, whether it was his voice or his hair, um, or he was too skinny, or he was swearing on court, or he never smiled. There was always seemed to be something, and it's quite difficult that, you know, listening to that about, you know, people criticising your kids. But um, when uh, Boris Becker uh, had, a, had a go at me, um, it was in 2011, I think, uh, Andy had lost in the Australian Open final, and it was his, I think it was his fourth Grand Slam final defeat. And Boris Becker did a column or an opinion piece for the Daily Express, which he obviously got paid for. And um, the headline was, ditch your mum, Andy, or you'll never win a slam. And it was when we got back from the Australian Open, it was on the billboard outside our local news agent, that's the Daily Express, and this, this kind of headline. And I went down to, I think I went down to get bread or something, and I saw it at the news agent, and I just turned around and got in my car and went home and didn't go out the house for about three days because I was so embarrassed. And I was just, and I was so angry and disappointed because I felt that because it was Boris Becker that because he's uh, such a big name in tennis that people would think he knows what he's talking about and she must be an absolute n nightmare. When actually, if, you, if, if people knew all the work that goes on behind the scenes, because you need somebody that you can trust when you're, when you're young. And actually, of all the things, apart from learning to coach and manage the, you know, all the tournament schedules and learn all that stuff, um, you're also having to learn things like you know, basic accounting, tax returns in four different countries. I, I, I did a PR course to learn about the media. So, uh, you know, at the start, we couldn't afford to pay anybody to do any of, of, of that stuff. You, you kind of had to do it all yourself. And so I ended up learning things out of necessity. Um, and it just really, really, really hurt me because Andy had a coach. You know, he was, I hadn't actually been his coach since probably since he was 12 or 13. I'd always been there and I'd always been managing things, but you know, I'd always, it was for me about finding the right coach and the right environment at the right time to help him to improve. And exactly the same with, with, with Jamie. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I think to be accepted as a good coach, you actually, I, I, I felt like I, and I think it's the same with women in a lot of different spheres. We have to be excellent to get to the top of, in everything, whereas men don't always have to be excellent, but we do. The world is often very unforgiving for women who are trying to to forge a path, um, and that certainly would be my experience. And it wasn't until Andy won Wimbledon in 2013 that I actually started to speak out about everything that I had encountered and and and, and the story that, that I've kind of told you tonight. I, I was doing some media for Fed Cup, that was all around the women's stuff. It was nothing to do with my family or my, my journey or anything, it was all about promoting the, the team. But I, I, it took him winning Wimbledon for me to find my voice and actually have a go at back at people like Boris Becker. Um, the hand in the last group. I give very long answers. <laughs> Um, what did you make of the last women's final at the US Open? Do you think that was an issue of sexism or just a player falling out with the umpire? Uh, <laughs> um, I, think it, I, think it was, uh, I think it was one of those unfortunate incidents that overshadowed the achievement of the winner in the end, I think that was the the sad thing um, about that. But I don't know. I think it's it's it, people react differently when they're under, you know, under extreme pressure. But I don't. I I didn't feel that it was a sexism. A sexism situation. But I didn't actually watch the match. I just kind of read about it um, in the news the, the, the next day, but I think that the whole incident overshadowed the fact that a, a really brilliant young player had, had just won her first Grand Slam. I think that, that was the sad thing about it. The other hand. Uh, so the last 15 years of men's tennis have kind of been dominated by four players and uh, they're going to retire in the next, you know, five years or so, who knows, but where do you think men's tennis will go from there, with like sort of regards to the next generation? Um, 
I think it, it's been an extraordinary batch of time where the slams especially and the Master Series have really been dominated by, by those four players. And I think it's been really good for the game because people identify with their names because they have all been successful for such a long time. And so it kind of ties in with what I was saying about the women's side with the Williams sisters and, and, and Sharapova. They've been dominant and very high profile for such a long time that I think tennis will really miss that when it's gone. And unless some others come through who can be as dominant, it of course it opens up opportunities for all sorts of any number of people to, to win any of the major competitions. But I think there are a lot of exciting young players coming through now. Um, uh, Tsitsipas really <coughs> liked the look of him. I love watching Shapovalov. Um, I think there's a lot of them. Zverev's having a tough time at the moment, but I think he'll he'll come back. So sometimes when they're young players and they have a, like a breakout year and they get right up towards the top, they struggle to learn to live at the top because suddenly they've gone from being the hunter to being the hunted and they struggle to deal with the expectation and all the demands on you from sponsors and media and, and all the rest of it. It sometimes knocks you off your stride a little bit but if you're a good player you always, you'll find a way back and um, I think I've seen that with quite a few players and on the women's side as well. So. I think it's difficult to know who, who will come through, but the ones who get to the top and stay at the top for a long time, they're incredible. They're, they're not just great players, they're great athletes, and they're incredibly mentally tough it, because it's a really tough sport. Um, you know, you're, you're competing about 11 months of the year, you're traveling across all different time zones, it's different surfaces, it's indoor, it's outdoor. Um, it's a very, very tough sport schedule and calendar for the men and the women, although the men's circuit is a bit longer th than the women's one. So, you know, only the toughest survive and can stay at the top for a long time. So I'm not sure if you'll see that kind of domination again for a while. Um, before we end, I just wanted to move in a different direction and ask about your appearance on Strictly Come Dancing. This Why do you <laughs> laugh? <laughs> Every time I do something like that, whenever anybody mentions Strictly, people start laughing and I don't understand that at all. <laughs> well, it's obviously such a different endeavour to your time as a coach. So what made you take this opportunity and what have you taken away from it? Yeah, it's, um, somebody asked me about that earlier. Um, yeah, I, I always loved Strictly, you know, watched it from when it started and, you know, when it started there were eight contestants on it and they were all starting from scratch. So I really enjoyed that whole thing of watching people learning a new skill and improving and how they tackled doing something that they were pretty crap at in front of a, an audience and so forth. So I always really enjoyed the, um, the, the show and when they asked me um, if I would be interested in doing it, I was just like, couldn't believe they asked me and I was just like, desperate to do it without really thinking what it would entail and um, when I was before I told them that I would definitely do it I thought I need to speak to the boys and ask them what they think because anything that each of us does or says especially if it's something out of the ordinary or controversial it kind of impacts on on on, on all of us so I took the safer option easier option perhaps and asked Jamie first and uh, <laughs> He said, oh, mum, you love Strictly, you, you'll do it, you'll have a great time, do it. And, I, and then I went and asked Andy what he thought, and he went, oh, my God, <laughs> you'll be rubbish. <laughs> and actually, you know, they were both right, because I had a great time, and I was rubbish. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, it's one of those things where I thought I would be a bit better at it. I didn't think I'd be good at it because I never danced. I don't like, I don't, I don't like dancing particularly. Um, I don't really even like music that much. I don't like nightclubs, I, I just, discos. I just, I don't like loud noise and things like that. I'm actually really boring. Um, so I'd never danced apart from like country dancing at school. So I don't know why I thought I, I might be okay at it, probably because I was sporty, but actually it's a completely different thing chasing a ball and moving instinctively than it is to learning a set routine because it's not just about the feet, it's the, the arms and the hands and the head and the neck and the smile and everything. And you have to do it in high heels and I never wear high heels. So that was a real challenge because I always felt off balance. But I had a, 
I got paired with Anton Dubeck, who I couldn't have had a better partner um, for me because he just made me laugh all day. And he never, ever made me feel that I was bad at what I did because he dressed everything up in humour so he could get his point across <coughs> with humour. So I ne he never made me feel bad about myself. He kind of didn't have to. I knew I was bad. But I knew that I was, uh, I knew that I was in trouble um, before we did the first dance because... You basically practice in an empty dance studio, obviously, just you and your partner and a CD player. And between each week, you've got about three and a half days to learn a new dance. And when you get paired up with your partner on the launch show, you've got two weeks before you have to do week one. So two weeks was still not long enough for me for the first week. But about four days before we were due to do the first dance, the set producer came to the, the studio when we were practicing. And I, so I sat down and had a, a drink of water and I heard him talking to Anton and Anton said, we're doing a Mull of Kintyre and it's a waltz or it's supposed to be a waltz. And he said, I want a bagpiper piping us in, like a real bagpiper. And he said, I want the full kilt outfit. I want the hairy handbag, sporin. <laughs> I want the dagger down my sock and I want Judy in a white dress and a tartan sash. Um, and I, I want a grassy hillock with heather all around it and she's going to sit, there's going to have a little seat carved out of it, she's going to sit in that and I'm going to pluck her off this grassy hillock and that will be the start of the dance. And I was sitting there thinking, oh that just sounds lovely, so romantic. <laughs> and then uh, he said, now it's Mull of Kintyre so it's mist rolling in from the sea so we want dry ice and can we have it to neck height? <laughs> Think about it. So that was when I knew I was in trouble and we, ha we hadn't even started. But it was, um, yeah, it was a lot of fun and, um, you know, we were, <coughs> we were always bottom, second bottom or third bottom of the leaderboard every week. And every week when you're up in that claudatorium and they're going through the, the scores, he would say to me every single week, they got it upside down again, partner. We were brilliant. <laughs> you know, so he was really good at making you feel, feel good about it. But it was absolutely terrifying. It was great fun all week and terrifying on the Saturday when you're standing up there and, you're, and they're counting you in and it's a dancing the whatever and you're thinking, oh, bleep, I've got to do it now. And you're so scared you're going to forget where you're, where you're going or you're going to trip. Um, but when you survive it, it's that whole thing of you're going right out of your comfort zone. And when you survive it, you get this enormous um, kind of adrenaline rush and boost of confidence because you have survived something that was truly terrifying. So a great experience. I made a lot of really good friends uh, from, from doing that series because when you're all in something together and you last quite a long time through it, um, y you make friends, you really make friends that are friends for life. Unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for today, but thank you so much for coming. And please join me in thanking Judy. <laughs>